So I'm Professor Cathy Willis and I work at the Royal Botanic Gardens in Kew. Polyploidy is a really interesting phenomenon in plants. It's effectively a whole genome duplication and it can occur once, twice, three times, four times so that you end up with multiple copies of chromosomes within the genome. And as a result of that, you get from that differential expression of, of sometimes differential expression of genes within the, within the plant. And that can result in sweeter fruit, bigger plants, more resilient plants to climate change. So a classic example of that is uh, the strawberries. So the big, nice, big, juicy strawberries we eat are a polyploid. And the diploid is the, well, the, the, the tiny little things you find in the back garden or the wild strawberries. And anyone that's sampled between those two straws will know that the really big, fat, juicy ones that you can buy in the supermarket are much sweeter and they've got a lot more sugar in them. And that is as a result of them being a polyploid. So it's a really interesting link through from the relevance of being a polyploid through to the food that we eat. A really good example of, of polyploidy in action is the fragrant orchid. This is work that's been done by some German researchers where they've looked at two sites in Switzerland where you've got, the, it's a single species, but in, the, in those two sites you've got both diploid and polyploid versions of the plant. And they, what they were asking is, if you've got more copies of the of the genes in, and, uh, because of being a polyploid, does that then change the way that the fragrant orchid smells? What they did, they took the diploid and polyploid individuals from these two sites and they extracted the scent from these orchids and they looked at the compounds that make up the scent. And what they showed very distinctively is that diploid and polyploid plants, even though they're the same species, have a different smell. Now, why is that relevant? Well, it's relevant because these plants are pollinated by moths and moths go for the smell of the plant. That's what attracts them. And what they found is those plants that were polyploid had much more visitations, a lot more visitations and a much more greater um, uh, fruiting success than those plants which were diploid. So therefore, in terms of your reproductive success, your polyploids were going to be more successful. And that goes on then to look at the whole question of pollination and pollination services. So that is it that, you know, in this case, certainly being a polyploid was an advantage. Kiwi fruit are a really good example of the difference between uh, polyploids and diploids and environmental resilience. So the, the hypothesis being that multiple copies of um, the genome results in greater genetic plasticity. And so they looked in the foothills of the Huan uh, province in China, and there are, there are three different varieties of kiwi fruit that grow there. There's a diploid, a tetraploid, and then an octoploid. So, you know, so th and when they looked at the, how they grew across the landscape, the, the, the diploid and the tetraploid, i.e. less copies of the genome, grew in the lowlands, in the foothills where there wasn't such um, dramatic climate change or dramatic variability in the climate and the ones that were the polyploid ones, the, the octoploids, were found in the mount, actually up in the high in the mountains we've got much more environmental variation. One of the issues with being a polyploid is it's not always a great trait because the traits that make polyploids good food and good sort of more resilient climate and, and more extreme climatic conditions also are the same traits that you need to be a really invasive plant. So some of our most invasive plants are also polyploid. So that includes, for example, the Japanese knotweed and also lantana. So th that's something we don't want. And we need, to, we need to be looking at which plants have these traits and what their potential is for invasiveness.